Hi everyone, um, on the last day of KubeCon, I hope everybody is doing great. Uh, we got an interesting slot just before the lunch, so hopefully you guys are not too hungry, right? Okay, so before, um, so we are going to talk about operator framework, what's new in, a, in the project, and uh, let's introduce ourselves. I am Laladinu Mohanty, working in Red Hat as a principal engineer. Rashmi could not join us for some reason, um, so we'll be just three of us presenting here. Uh, Bryce? Yep. Uh, I'm Bryce Palmer. Uh, I'm on the same team as Lala. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat, um, and I'm also a member of the steering committee in the operator framework. Um, so happy to be here uh, talking about what's new. Um, hi. Uh, can you hear me? So I'm Attila. Um, I work for Apple. I'm also a member of steering committee and uh, mainly maintaining the Java operator SDK. Awesome. Yeah. So before I go to the next slide, a uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have used operators? Okay, almost all of you, that's great. How many of you have installed an operator in a cluster? Okay. How many of you have installed OLM on Kubernetes cluster? Okay, only three, five hands, okay, that's great. So the next, um, about a little bit about the operator framework project. Uh, it was created to simplify uh, the management of Kubernetes native applications. And um, with the current version, uh, we call it OLMv0, we have more than 370 operators in operator um, hub. And uh, you know, we have the release, the GitHub release has been downloaded more than 9 million times. And uh, the GitHub project has more than 1,700 stars. And we are a cloud native, uh, cloud um, native uh, foundation incubating project right now. Yes. And the current state of project is the pro the community has been working on the next iteration of OLM, which is we're calling it OLM v1. Last several months, and uh, because we are putting all of our effort in OLM v1, the OLM v0 project is currently in maintenance. And uh, you know we're not taking new features. Uh, however, the blocker, critical issues, critical CVs would be addressed um, in the best of a basis. And you can refer to the readme of that project, which have more information about what we you know accept, what we do not. Uh, let's move to the next next slide, which is why OLMv1. So, one of the most important aspect we uh, we want to address with OLMv1 is we want to simplify the API. So that's it's become way easier to comprehend, and the operator developers, authors, the life of you know life of the operator authors becomes easier, it's less complex. So that effort, for that effort, effort we have like you can see in the slide, right? We have reduced the API significantly. So OLM V0 had like nine APIs, and right now V1 has only two APIs. So it's a significantly less number of APIs, easier to comprehend. The complexity, complexity hopefully would be reduced. Um, so we can make it more intuitive, and um, also one of the important aspect of volume v one to make it more secure. And there is various aspect to the security, and Bryce would cover some of these in his design decision kind of discussion later today, and in this same talk. And let's go to the next slide, which is with volume v one, we also want to be more flexible. Uh, for example, we do not want to restrict ourselves to only the operator format, but to various other formats, whatever Kubernetes would support. Uh, and uh, you know, for example, is a uh, operator developer, or you want to just give us a config map, we would accept it. I think we don't want to enforce as much as less enforcement, so that it's more flexibility, uh, you know, so that it's better for um, authors and users. And the same line, we want to also support packaging format like Helm. Helm is pretty popular, everybody uses it. So we'll, we'll support it. Yep. And uh, Bryce will talk about the design decisions. Yep. So um, there's a lot of different design decisions that we've kind of, uh, we, OLM v1 is essentially a ground up rewrite of OLM. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we've kind of looked back on and reflected on what we did in OLM v0. And we're like, ah, those maybe weren't the right decisions. Uh, but at the time, we felt they were. Uh, so, OLMv1 is a great opportunity for us to reconsider some of those. Uh, so, in particular, one of the design decisions that we have is don't fight Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is pretty opinionated on uh, some of the ways that CRDs are kind of 
applied on the cluster. Um, versioning is hard, things like that. Uh, in OMV0, we attempted to have kind of a management system that allowed for multiple bundles to specify a CRD. Uh, so sort of in the example here, we've got uh, the bundle for foo operator v1.0.0 .0 contains both a, a controller, so whatever is necessary for that controller to run on the cluster, plus a CRD. Uh, when that's installed, CRD goes on the cluster, that's cluster-wide. The foo controller will go into uh, namespace A in this case. Uh, somebody comes along and says, hey, I also want to install foo operator 1.1.0. Um, there's not really great tooling around CRD versioning and upgrades and things like that. So if somebody came in and happened to make a breaking change that we wouldn't catch or that Kubernetes wouldn't catch, it would overwrite that CRD. Um, in the case that uh, you have both of these versions, if Foo Controller 1.0.0 can no longer speak the same language that 1.1.0 introduced in for, that, for their CRD, you kind of have this stomping effect where OMV0 would stomp all over any changes in the scenario where you're like, oh, well, now I need to go update namespace A's, foo, uh, the bundle I installed for foo operator 1.0.0, uh, you run the risk of stomping in the other direction. Um, so there's a lot of issues there with having kind of a shared management of CRDs. Uh, so what are we doing in OMV1? Uh, extensions are meant to be cluster-wide. Right? So when you're installing an extension at the cluster level, only one, ob only one extension will be able to own re these resources. Uh, so if you have shared resources in this case, foo, if you install foo operator 1.0.0 first, it'll install the CRD and the controller. You go to install foo operator 1.1.0, it'll say, whoa, somebody else already owns this CRD. We're not going to stomp all over that. Um, and so what does that mean for multi-tenancy, right? Like, I have, a, I have a need to be able to support multiple different tenants that need different versions of this controller running. Uh, only v1 isn't going to have uh, any sort of specific opinions in terms of trying to enable multi-tenancy, but we're not going to prevent it. Um, so the way that you would kind of do this is package authors would probably have to repackage some of the existing things in order to support that multi-tenancy environment by extracting their CRDs out of these, bun these cluster-wide bundles into a separate bundle that has the APIs. And then when you install the operator bundles that have some form of dependency on the, the APIs, uh, they can be installed in their own separate namespaces. And uh, the key thing here is that the controllers that are installed must agree on the API, API provided by the CRD. Like, they have to speak the same language. Um, and it'll be up to cluster administrators or whoever's managing the multi-tenant environment to facilitate upgrading the CRD and controllers uh, according to their user needs. Uh, secure by default is another one of our design decisions. Um, only v0 has historically had cluster admin permissions, uh, so it can manage the extensions across the cluster. Uh, but that makes only v0 prone to be used as a privilege, privilege escalation vector, uh, specifically through confused deputy problems. Um, anybody who is able to create the only v0 resources basically has cluster admin rights. Um, in order to be more security conscious, and only v1, we're not going to have cluster level permissions. Our service account is only going to have the necessary permissions to do what we need to do with our APIs. Um, what we're doing is we're shifting the power back to cluster admins. Uh, so they are going to have to create a service account and assign the appropriate permissions to that service account such that you give it to our API that we have on cluster whenever you go to install an extension, and we will uh, get the, to the token for that service account and use the, authenticate with the Kubernetes API server using the same permissions that that service account has uh, to attempt to install and upgrade stuff. Uh, so this means that no longer have escalated privileges, uh, and we actually now prevent automatic upgrades that would result in uh, granting escalated privileges, because if a cluster admi admin didn't explicitly give uh, permissions to the service account. When we go to upgrade, we'll notice that there's extra permissions that we don't have anymore, and we'll throw in our status uh, that, hey, we don't have these permissions. We need you to provide them to us in order for us to con continue the upgrade. Um, so uh, another one is simple, predictable install, upgrade, and delete semantics. Uh, so OMV0 
is notorious for not really being GitOps friendly due to some imperative decisions that it makes. Uh, OLMV1 prioritizes using two declarative APIs for representing both a catalog of content and intent for that content to be installed on the cluster. Any actions taken by OLMV1 are deterministic, uh, making it significantly more friendly to use the APIs that we're delivering in OLMV1 in your GitOps workflows. Uh, users can pin specific versions of a package, package channels, and or version ranges. Uh, by default, OLMV1 will have some guardrails in place. Whoops. Um, one of them is a, that we default to adhering to package author upgrade graphs. Uh, so if folks are familiar with the channel concept in existing OLM bundles, we'll continue to respect package author channels, um, but we will have an escape hatch there for users to be able to override that decision when they need to. Um, so uh, if you've ever attempted to perform a downgrade operation in OLMV0, you likely know how difficult that is. Uh, in order to achieve something similar to that in OLMV1, uh, you would simply update your version reference to a lower version than is installed, and then you would update any of the guardrails that we have in place to protect against breaking changes or things like that on your cluster uh, to say that I've self-certified, that this is okay, I'm happy with this happening on my cluster, and we'll go ahead and we'll downgrade for you. Uh, in OLMV0, uh, whenever you would delete the resources associated with an installed extension, uh, you would delete the workloads, but it wouldn't delete the CRDs or CRs. Um, that could lead to various other issues related to ownership of client expectations, uh, especially because we would delete conversion webhooks as well. Uh, in OLMV1, when you delete any of the resources associated with an installed extension, uh, all resources, or not any of the resources associated with, but the top level resource for managing the installed extension, all of the resources managed uh, by, that, by that cluster extension are gonna be removed from the cluster. Uh, we don't currently have support for orphaning resources, uh, but it is on our roadmap for OLMV1. Um, APIs and behaviors for common controller patterns. Uh, in the past, OLM has been very opinionated as to the shape of bundles, uh, with, those with those opinions being very controller-centric. Con controller uh, so you could only do things that were really controller-related. Uh, in OLMV1, we're taking a little bit of a different approach. We're gonna be a lot less opinionated on the actual shape and we're gonna happily install any of the resources in a bundle. Uh, so with that said, for bundles that do contain common controller related resources like CRDs, RBAC resources, webhooks, what have you, uh, we are going to continue to have some sort of opinionated behaviors on how we handle those. Uh, just some examples are best effort CRD upgrade safety checks, so we don't want you to break your cluster when you do an upgrade, and that introduces changes in a CRD that might cause data loss or corruption or invalidation of what's stored in etcd. Uh, we'll also have specific knowledge in handling webhooks, and uh, we do have a couple of other things on our roadmap, uh, specifically around permission validation, so before we even attempt to do installs or something like that, we wanna make sure that the service account we have won't leave an install in like a limbo state. Um, and the APIs that we provide, uh, while the goal is to be able to install bundles of any kind. We might have to have some sort of APIs that are optional uh, to allow configuration of some of the, con the common controller pattern uh, behavior that we respect. Uh, and constraint checking is another design decision. So we're going to have no dependency resolution among packages in the catalog. Um, Olam v1 is gonna provide constraint checking based on the available cluster state, and it'll be limited to checking whether can the constraints are met. If the constraints are met, installation upgrade proceed, if not, any unmet constraints are reported and installation upgrade will be held until those constraints are met. Uh, OLMV1 is gonna provide some official CLI tooling. Uh, we are taking the stance that 100% uh, of the, the use cases for managing extensions will be accessible via our on cluster APIs. Official CLIs are gonna cover standard user flows, about 80% of the use cases. Um, so, some of this might include things like identifying which permissions are necessary to install a bundle, identifying your installation dependencies or what have you. Uh, if you're interested in this area, we'd love to have you join the community and kind of let us know what workflows you'd like to see enabled by some official tooling. Uh, and then the remaining 20% of use cases uh, will be likely covered by a third party or unofficial CLIs. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a live demo. Who doesn't like 
Who doesn't like lab demos? Uh, hopefully, everything works well. Uh, okay. So, what I've got here is I've got a cluster running with our 1.0 release candidate installed. Uh, and what we're going to do is we'll show that we have a new API called Cluster Catalogs. If you're familiar with the Catalog Source API from OpenV0, this is kind of a translation. Uh, what we see here is that we have successfully unpacked the catalog contents and we're serving it over a HTTP server. Uh, and we will also start to, uh, knowing that we have, we're, we're going to install the Argo CD operator, we know that that's in that catalog. Um, so we will go ahead and create a namespace to install in. So we'll create the Argo CD uh, namespace. Uh, and then we mentioned that we need a service account. So in that namespace, we'll create the Argo CD installer service account. And just for this live demo, we do not recommend doing this in production. We are going to bind the cluster admin role to that service account. Uh, I'm gonna reiterate, do not do this in production. Uh, it is very insecure and is not why we designed the service account approach. Uh, and then from there, we will go ahead and apply our new cluster extension API. Uh, so here you can see we've got the namespace, the service account, and we are sourcing from a catalog with the package name Argo CD operator. And uh, that version field there can be any kind of semantic version range, um, but we're gonna pin it to 060. And so when we run this, uh, it was created. And let's see, did we successfully install? So let's go ahead and get the cluster extensions. And Boom, we can see Argo CD has been successfully installed and we are ready to progress towards any future states, whether that's an upgrade to a new version or what have you. Uh, so that's just super quick demo to get up and running with OLMV1 and get something installed on the cluster. Um, hopefully folks familiar with OLMV0 uh, see how much of a nicer experience that is by only having to deal with two, a two APIs rather than subscriptions, install plans, operator groups, CSVs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and interlinking the mental model between them. Uh, so switching back to the slides, I will hand it off to Lala to finish up. Thanks, thanks Bryce, it's a great demo. Um, so like Bryce was, I think, mentioned during his demo that we have already got like RC1 in upstream. Yep. Uh, so we're very soon going to do 1.0 GA in upstream. However, there are a lot of things we have not done yet um, and would love to get your feedback on this kind of stuff. So for example, um, Right now, the limitation is only supports the registry v1 bundle format, like v0. And um, also, it does not have any webhook support. Only supports all mv0, all namespace uh, install mode. But um, you know, we want to fix these things. And your feedback would definitely help us to prioritize which one we fix first. One of the reasons also we haven't you know, implemented all of this in the first go is like to understand whether how much um, you know, community needs some of these features and then prioritize accordingly. Also, like the, you know, all in, with all in v1, the service account by default does not have cluster admin privilege, right? We want admins to provide what access they want to give that particular cluster extension uh, in the cluster. So we want them to provide the service account, but it's hard to create, um, you know, determine the RBAC and service account, and we need to provide some tooling for that. Um, so if I, the next slide, is actually going to talk about roadmap. And uh, for the short term roadmap, we, we want to support direct uh, installation of bundles without any catalog. Also, tooling to create, help you know, create the RBAC and uh, the service account. Also, extending support for existing registry v1 bundles, making sure whatever operators was written with you know, all MV0, they are supported, backwards supported. Uh, backward compatibility, right? And then we also create tooling for content authors and cluster administrator to make their life easy. And, um, you know, please, if you have an opinion, I think it's good to have your opinion in the upstream community. Uh, and please let us know what's your views on all of this thing. Uh, for the long term plan, we want to support Helm Chart. And also, we want to report the health condition of the cluster extension and the, all the resources which it manages. Uh, so that's the important aspect. You want to know whether you know, the operator is running fine or not. And then we also want to create a tool from migrating from OLM v0 to v1. 
Cool. So move to the next slide. Um, so we want to get your feedback. So we, we do, we have OLM dev channel in Kubernetes Slack channels. And uh, I also put the email there. We do weekly meetings on Tuesdays, uh, 10, 11 a.m. EST time. Um, so please you know, join those meetings. We'd be happy to hear from you. And then I just linked also one of the repository there so that you can go and read some of the readme's and information we put there. And now, Atila is going to talk about Java Hopper SDK. Thank you. OK. Hi. So now something almost completely different. Uh, Java Operator SDK v5 is a new upcoming version, major version of Java Operator SDK. It's basically quite a big effort. We have implemented about 50 features, improvements, and issues uh, for this major release, and uh, should be released in coming weeks, right after Quarkus counterpart part will be done too. And uh, basically, there were issues which piled up uh, that required API changes. So that was the reason for the major version release. Uh, there are a few renamings, improvements on the domain language and stuff that will for sure impact everyone, but migration should be almost trivial. And we removed the deprecated APIs, increased the minimal Java version to 17. Uh, there is no very nice highlight that I would show you, so I cherry picked some issues which I, for some reason, I think should be fair to talk about. And uh, yeah, the first one is the server-side apply support. So you are able to do almost everything until now, also with server-side applied. It just for some specific places where the server-side applied wasn't really um, utilized. First was the finalizer handling and. If you use our APIs for patching resources, not the client, then it, by default it used client side applied. But from v5, the default will be server side applied. The problem is that usually what we faced or had some issues is migration. So if you used in the past, and this is true basically for every, every language or every framework, um, client side applied, then and you are moving to uh, server side applied, and that should can be very problematic in some cases. So for every, I would advise to test the migration. In the release notes, we point out some uh, problematic cases and how to solve it, but I'm sure there are more uh, somewhere hidden in, in Kubernetes API server uh, machinery. Uh, but uh, we provide the feature flag almost for every these changes to use a firmer approach. So if you don't want to use, or it's for some reason the migration is problematic, you don't want to do it now, uh, you can just use the previous approach and use client side applied. The other issue with the server side applied that is a probably change for everyone is uh, how it should work, how it's intended to work is to always use just the resource with the fully specified intent, how Kubernetes defines it. Basically, you have to always create a fresh resource with your uh, fields or attributes you take care about or want to care about and apply those resources. And uh, yeah. That means you are probably not going to change resources from the cache as you would done now, uh, but you will start with a new resource from the cache from the scratch and you just change uh, uh, and uh, describe the desired state there. Um, the other, other issue is with the multi cluster support. Or in, so, for multiple users were actually asking for multi cluster support. And this is a quite big topic in the controller world. We uh, have an ongoing discussion how to support it in the long term. For short term, we just provide informer level multi-cluster support that you can provide an informer and that handles you the events and caches for the target resource. And then uh, you can just provide a Kubernetes client that is initialized to communicate with a remote API server. And you will resolve all the events and whatnot. Uh, there are caveats like you cannot use, of course, owner references and stuff like that with remote clusters. So, and that I think that's obvious. You have to use annotations usually. Uh, but that's it. If you have feedback or uh, any request regarding multi cluster support, we'll take a look. And for long term, we are planning to do more regarding in this topic. Um, the additional change or another change in low level APIs is. Uh, we have a way to access cached resources. There is a unified API, the context gets secondary resource. 
And um, basically what we are doing is now you always clone the resource. So if you change the resource, the cache wouldn't be cor cor corrupted. Um, we changed this because in V5, because multiple users are complaining that if you do it often on large resources, the cloning actually is a performance, has a performance impact. So uh, by default, we don't clone. And if you combine it with the server-side appliance, usually you don't really want to change the resource from the cache because you, again, always making a new fresh copy of the resource. So actually, this shouldn't be an issue if you are moving to server-side appliance. Um, so the next uh, topic of or category of um, improvements is our higher level API. In Java Operator SDK provides out of the box a workflow or state machine, uh, basically how high level abstraction of managing resources. Uh, we call it workflows and dependent resources. Think of Terraform just for operators. And uh, we do, did a few refinements in this debt and improvements like First is the activation condition. So imagine that you have a controller that manages some resources, uh, for example, but not all the resource types are present on cluster. Like typically in OpenShift has routes while pure Kubernetes doesn't. So for that, uh, we provide a new a condition type called activation condition and it checks if the, actually the resource is supported in the cluster. So this, for example, cert manager and other um, utilities might not be present on the cluster for the controller. So if you mark it with activation condition, this, it will register the informers in the background if the CRD is present, otherwise won't do anything and don't reconcile the, that target resource. And we provide a generic uh, activation condition uh, to handle basically based on the CRD if it's present very efficiently. Um, others than these workflows are in the past were executed before the reconcile method code on the low-level API. Um, we provide now a feature that you can call it explicitly, the managed ones, and basically do all kinds of validations and uh, pair processing because these workflows are called, or you, are just, you might just skip the reconciliation of these workflows. Um, yeah, so that also was quite a hot topic uh, before. And some others, uh, there was this confusing notion as resource discriminator. If you have multiple resources for, uh, for or multiple dependent resources from say type, you have to associate somehow the resource with the dependent resource. For that was this resource discriminator used, but we were completely able to eliminate this and just select the target resource based on desired state. And uh, multiple users were asking for bulk dependent resources in read-only mode, which actually required an API change. This is when you have to a dynamic number of resources, uh, think of for each in Terraform, uh, of, uh, in a workflow, and yeah, that read-only mode doesn't support it yet. Um, and f as a last one, something experimental uh, for what we require feedback. Basically, if we added a method called is next reconciliation imminent? That you can check if there is already, we have an event received that will trigger the next reconciliation. So our the thinking and our, some of our users and some inputs that, so there is a, some heavy workload that you will have to anyway do next time, very shortly after. You might just want to skip it in the current reconciliation and do it in the next one. I think it's a gray area feature, so we don't need, uh, we need feedback and mark it as a stable in the future if, if it makes sense for you. But so that was all I wanted to show, uh, some cherry pick issues and giving back the word to Bryce. Yep, so we're gonna quickly go over the operators to K. Uh, so for those that are familiar with it, it's a CNCF incubating project, um, and we're doing a call for maintainers. Uh, like many of the projects in the CNCF that have given talks in the maintainer track, a lot of them are asking for help. Um, I think it's a pretty common problem in the open source world of just not enough maintainers. Um, a lot of the maintainers that have historically worked on the operators to K have left the project for various region, reasons. Uh, that's led to little to no feature development and uh, over the last year, um, mostly focusing on keeping up with Kubernetes and uh, handling and fixing critical bugs uh, and issues. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a maintainer, uh, feel free to reach out to Joe Lanford. Uh, he's right here in the front of the crowd. Um, and 
and or myself on the Kubernetes Slack channel, hash operator SDK dev. Um, you can attend the bi-weekly operator SDK community meeting and attend, or attend the monthly operator framework steering committee meeting. Uh, those are all on the operator framework calendar uh, that should be available in any of our operator framework related channels, should be available on our community repo uh, or the CNCF uh, calendar. Um, if you are interested in becoming a maintainer, uh, we'll work with you to find the best path to get you uh, on, the, on the way to becoming a maintainer. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, so we'll, I think we have some time for questions and, questions and to provide you some answers to your questions. Um, feel free to step up to the mic uh, or come up to us after and uh, we're happy to, to chat. Yeah. Uh, you, you covered about version one upgrade coming up soon. So do you guys have any timelines of when we are targeting about that? And also the another follow up question is like, I know you are, we are still in incubation. Are we working towards uh, getting GA or? Uh, so I, just to make sure you're talking about timeline for GA of OLMV1. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, version one release is one of the things yeah. we were talking about. So right. version one is one thing. Right. And don't it. Yeah, so earlier this week, we cut our uh, version one GA release candidate. Uh, we're working on finalizing a couple of things, and then we're planning to cut a GA release as soon as possible. Um, so hopefully that's next week. Um, and that'll mean that we are comfortable with what we have currently available uh, in that 1.0.0 release to be production ready. Um, and in terms of CNCF project graduation, uh, I do not know any timelines on that. I know that there's um, a long process to go from incubation to graduated. Um, and I yeah. think as we continue to grow and, and grow a community around the operative, operative framework uh, and have more maintainers and things like that, that's when we'll probably start to consider going towards graduated from incubating. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks, great talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, controller generation. Uh, is there any opinion in Operator SDK or OLM about uh, generating a Kubernetes controller? For example, when I come from a REST API with an, maybe an open AI spec and then get to a Kubernetes controller without like manually implementing that? Uh, so the Operator SDK has a few different ways that you can generate controllers. Uh, one is it wraps the QBuilder project, that's a Kubernetes SIG project for generating Go-based operators. And then we have uh, Ansible operator generation, so you can generate an, an operator that uh, is able to, you're able to write like Ansible playbooks and things like that, and it'll have a custom resource that once an event happens for a CR, it'll trigger certain playbooks based on the configuration, as well as if you've got a Helm chart that there's uh, also a way for you to generate a operator that, given a Helm chart, once you create the custom resource for that custom resource definition, it'll go ahead and it'll apply that Helm chart somewhere on the cluster uh, based on whatever configuration options are in the custom resource. Um, so so yeah. those, are, those are the three methods that kind of exist within the operator framework for generating controllers. Um, there might be some other tooling out there for generating controllers based off of other already existing sets of things, but uh, that's what we offer from the operator SDK. Yeah, for, for from operator framework point of view, we are not working on any, any, any tools which will generate a controller for you. Uh, just, just something, there was an initiative in our side to generate based on open API, synchronize resources for open API to Kubernetes API. Um, I wasn't working on it with some colleague and uh, basically there is a blog post about it, but it was failed. <laughs> <laughs> so. Was it like long work or how, how, when was it? So if you have an open API definition right. and uh, you can kind of generate also a CRD and, uh, and basically synchronizing the APIs with the Kubernetes API. Right. And, uh, but I think that it was uh, too much corner cases which mm -hmm. were problems. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, what, what I'm yeah. seeing as well. Um, do you have a, a which, on which block was that posted? Well, I can send it to you. I, I don't have it at the hand. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. And I believe we're at time. 
Uh, I don't know if we have time for Probably one more question. Last question? Yeah. Last question. I think it's really fine. I was just going to say that uh, the scoping down thing is really exciting. Um, we've always been a little bit worried about opening up the entire catalog to a cluster and not auditing everything that the users could possibly do. This makes it a, a lot safer. Yep. Yeah, and that's one of the, the main reasons why uh, we, we had got a lot of feedback that you know we don't want to install certain operators because your OLM's giving everything cluster permission. There's no kind of security uh, focused stuff in OLM v0. Uh, other than being able to use operator groups to potentially restrict some stuff, but that's a very complex process and things like that. Using existing Kubernetes resources like service accounts and cluster roles, roles, role bindings, what have you, um, or, and any other policy engines that are configured through your authorizers um, seems to be a, a better approach for yeah, and cluster we're admins. Al we're already using uh, like a tenant operator to maintain like operator groups and stuff associated with it. So like we can just make service accounts mm. uh, pre-set up for the users. So that, that, that part's tractable. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, right. everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.